We take a single episode of a science fiction TV series and overanalyze it to within an inch of its life. This is the Fusion Patrol Podcast. Welcome to the discussion. Hello and welcome to another episode of Fusion Patrol. I'm Eugene. And I'm Ben. And tonight we are looking at the Fantastic Journey episode, A Dream of Conquest. Our intrepid heroes arrive in a new zone, just in time to see a group of aliens attacking an alien creature that looks a bit like a pig ape. Um, They don't like it, but they're captured by them. They're taken back where they meet uh, Tarrant, the alien sort of warlord wannabe who's just waiting for the current leader to die of a mysterious illness. He wants to get the travelers on their way, but they, being healers and such, want to help out instead. When it becomes apparent that Tarrant is not such a good guy, Willoway decides to dupe him and pretend to be his best pal so that he can find out and destroy his invasion plans. But it may not go all to plan. Okay, so, uh, what do you think of this one? Uh, disappointing. Disappointing? Yeah, disappointing. I, I had no expectations, so I wasn't disappointed. I, I, I did, and, and it wasn't good expectations either, and yet I was still disappointed. Well, that was worse than I thought then, huh? Yeah, it was pretty sad. Um, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't particularly good. At, you know, this is... I didn't think the last ones were particularly good either, and, and this, surprisingly this one enough, was, this one's kind this of was, not good either. <laughs> uh, this this one was actually this, this one was bad. It, it's that simple. It was just it was just bad, and and and, and yeah, so many bad on so many different levels. <laughs> it just pains me. Uh, I mean, right from the moment we see John Saxon in here beating I mean, up for, his henchmen. Well, at first I'm thinking, okay, well, this is around you know, a couple of years after he did Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee, where he got to show off his martial arts skills, and because um, I believe he was a student of Bruce Lee at one time. Huh. So I did not I think know he got, that. I believe he was, because uh, before Bruce died and before he did Enter the Dragon, he was actually teaching a lot of Hollywood actors um, martial arts. It, it became very chic. And I think John Saxon was one of them, which is why um, Bruce wanted him in, in that last film. So, of course, now what we get, we get John Saxon just completely, you know, beating the snot out of everybody. But the thing that, <laughs> the thing that kept running through my head was if I was some traveler who was just coming, you know, tr- you know, coming into this new time zone and I see this new leader, you know, the first thing, the first thing that run through my head was, hey, you look like John Saxon. You must be a bad guy. <laughs> John, yeah, John Saxon's. Uh, no, he's not always been the bad guy. He was in those Gene Roddenberry thingies. Oh, I can't remember. I can never remember their names. It's not Earth Two. There's Genesis Two. Well, there was Genesis Two, Earth Two. Uh, I think there was Planet Earth, uh, Spectre. Um, I don't recall. I mean, except for the later ones that well, I think uh, Kent Majel did. I think what's his. Uh, the guy who played Archangel in Alex Cord, I think he played the guy, he played that character that got frozen and zapped into the future in the first one, and then they replaced him with John Saxon in the second one, and I can never remember their names. One of them is Genesis 2. Planet hmm. Earth might be the other one. Th- those are the Roddenberry ones with the yeah. Pax organization that strangely had uh, a guy, a sort of a half-human, half alien violent creature with a sort of a ridged head and an empath and god um, that sounds too familiar it does doesn't it team it it was um we'll try try again um so he was a good guy in some things um, well no no that's true but let me put it this can't way think of any others but... let me let me rephrase it um it should be like if i come into a time zone and i say oh you look like john saxon and you're really melodramatic you're a bad guy okay okay fair enough um, <laughs> but they didn't see John Saxon until they, they got taken at gunpoint to his headquarters. So I'm thinking they <laughs> might have had a clue. <laughs> that would have been, yeah, th- that would have been something, yeah, yeah, yeah. A wake up call right there and then. So, um, did we ever get any understanding why they knew they were aliens? No, none, except I think Varian, Varian blurts out, they're from the future. And I'm like, Really? Well, Leanna said they're aliens, 
and maybe maybe her tele- and telepathic good. or whatever skills whatever mental skill she's got was the big giveaway but there was never any indication right up front i mean yes it turns out they were it was confirmed but there was no overt indication oh wait that Nana they said they're not from this dimension is that what she said yeah talking about the creature the little the ape oh ape thing. yeah not from this dimension and then varian said they're aliens too yeah i went talking about the men either way it must have been some sort of a chi thing maybe because i can't figure out how i mean what the indication is I mean, they, as as we know, I mean that that island is um, a repository for people from all multiple times, you know, like from it was Earth. from Varian, uh, yeah, from Earth. So who's to say? I mean, granted, Liana's a bit of an exception there, but as we've seen, people from all different eras uh, on Earth have managed to land there, past, present, future. I mean, who's to say that's a that's a time that's even beyond Varian's? Yeah, I mean, alien. We, a, Earth could doesn't be have to be by aliens. aliens. Well, I they mean, could they be populated by extraterrestrial beings that move to Earth and live here yeah. from the future. So, yeah, I mean, they could be could be all sorts of. Uh, I'm guessing that they probably said that just to cut to the chase. Yeah. So here's the the basic gist of of this ridiculous story. The leader is dying of a mysterious illness, and uh, he's much beloved. And uh, John Saxon's character, Tarrant is uh, letting people think that he's really basically, you know, he's going to die uh, or he is dead or uh, and, and once he is, then I'm going to be the leader and uh, and he endorses me. I mean, who would fall for that story? Well, that, apparently that a lot like, of people did. I mean, I, I can't imagine anybody watching it even back then. I don't I didn't buy it even as you know, at that 15 years old as I'm watching, I'm thinking, mm, no. No. Well, yeah, they they were not being subtle here. I mean, when when the second in command brought Tarrant the visitors, he says, "I've got um, I've got five brought you five visitors," and he said, "Well, kill them here or kill them there or something like that." And then no, he, they said, he, "Oh, I brought them through." Well, oh, Tarrant, okay. Tarrant's like nice. Tarrant saying, "Get rid of them." I escort them through. I mean, he didn't want anything to do with them. No, he his... said, "Kill them first. He said, "Kill them before he, they walk through the door." He said, "Did, did you kill them here or did you?" Bring them all. Yeah, he, he basically said, kill him. And then his second command says, no, I brought him here to see you. And then when he opened the door, he was all like, well, let's get him on their way and get him out of here. So, yeah, I mean, they, they were not making any, or certainly any bones making about any friends. It. No, no. I mean, it was pretty obvious that he was quite the bad guy. Besides, anytime you ever see a bad guy and the first thing he's a guy, the first thing he's doing is beating up his henchmen and complaining they're not good enough. You know they're the bad guy. Yeah, it's like yeah. yeah I, I would love to have had John Saxon acting in an episode opposite John Colicos. Oh my God, the 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 evil melodrama would have just been overflowing. It's interesting. I, I I mean, yes, I've seen John Saxon in a lot of things as bad guys, but I never really thought of him as being over the top. I always thought of him as being sort of inadequate to the job. Now, pick I, I don't know if John Saxon's well, still alive think- or not, but I just I have not been terribly impressed with his but bad that's guy why roles. he go, that's why he overdoes it that's why he gets very melodramatic because um that's his compensation it's the only way he knows how to play it so yes it's over the top and in by doing it over the top he comes up short he'll never be better than that time he was the first robot villain against the six million dollar man that was, that was uh, the pinnacle of his career day of the robots excellent episode uh, yeah i think that is right yeah i think that is right day of the robot yeah very good episode. And he, yeah, he actually played that well. And see, he was a good guy in it, too. He was a good guy, until, guy he was was na- a, until he was a robot, then he was yeah. a bad guy. But then he was a human again, and he, then he was a good guy again. Yeah. But then I think, I think to other things that he's done, I mean, the most recently I saw him in uh, Roger Corman's Battle Beyond the Stars. Oh, yeah. Okay, he was chewing the scenery. In oh, that big time. Yeah, it was, it was insane, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a Roger Corman film, so you're, you're kind of expected to be over the top and it's okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Battle Beyond the Stars was a... Yeah. Um, that was a, a a particular type of film that called for... That Absurd kind of... acting. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But we got a lot of that, John. You know, the the melodrama was here, too. And uh, I, I the, the scenes between him and, and Roddy McDowell mm-hmm. were comical in the overacting. 
that was going on there. <laughs> yeah, they weren't they weren't playing it very subtle. I have to say. Let, let's just take a let's let's uh, before we get to the meat of the episode, which is the whole Roddy McDowell sub theme here. Oh yeah, and I really want to get to that. Um, travelers are asked, are oh, there any healers? And of course, uh, we've got Fred and Varian, who are uh, different forms of healers. Varian is apparently a healer who can't do anything in this episode, and Fred uh, is of course completely unqualified to work on aliens, but. That doesn't stop him from trying. Did did you? I I thought that was odd that he was complaining that you know uh, I don't know, we're gonna have to call in your magic put wand your magic there, wand yeah because he was stumped he was stumped but I don't know I would have gone with a magic wand first but well, it seemed like Varian was sort of like well I can't you know aliens and stuff I was like well but I think Varian was also sort of implying that whatever condition. That perhaps it was bacterial. That that yeah. That that Luther was <laughs> it suffering doesn't from antibiotics. It, it exactly. It doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, I suppose if if you really wanted to get into the science of of using sound in a very precise manner, maybe there is you know there is some kind of uh, idea or some some ridiculous idea that uh, if sound is very particularly focused and utilized in such a, a very specialized and intense sort of way, maybe it could. Um, obliterate certain invading cells or something along that line. But here, you know, again, this is 1977 television. So uh, Varian with his sonic energizer was, it, that was, it, it was, it was a new fanciful idea. Mm. So the writers had really had absolutely no idea what the heck they can do with it, except, um, it, you, yeah, well, heal bones and destroy locks. Speaking of um, 1970s science fiction, how about that model replica of the advanced alien of spacecraft? The space shuttle. I know. I, I stopped and went, okay, um, I'm color me impressed. Where? Wow. Because I don't think they're, I mean, by that point, I don't even think we had the, the test model for the Enterprise yet. The Enterprise what year shuttle. What was this show? 77. Did we have the, the Enterprise shuttle? Yeah, I think so. But we didn't have the rocket boosters yet. Yeah, but that, the thing had been planned since the 60s. It must have been. I would imagine that. Well, I would imagine that, yeah, there must have been some sort of planning on that. Um, but I was still really amazed when I saw that. And I, I would imagine at, that. At the same time, though, wouldn't you equally have been, uh, I mean, I was appalled. If it had been a, if it had been a DC-3 plane, um, Ooh, crack at the Scientologists. Um, I would have been equally as like, really? You're trying to fob off actually our space shuttle as their alien spacecraft? That was the part that bugged me. It's like, really? <laughs> I wasn't so so much that they were trying to pass that off, but the, the fact that it was just simply there is what amazed me. Um, that just felt to me like they couldn't even be bothered to try to make something up. Like, uh, we got a space shuttle model. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, that wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. I mean, they're reusing... No of, No, they're reusing of, of uh, sets, sound effects, visual effects in some cases, costuming, makeup. I mean... The phaser it, noise was obviously... Yeah, the phaser. phaser noise was obvious. And then, of course, I mean, all you had to do was take a look at the, the, the pet, if you want to call it that. I mean, that makeup style had been reused... Um, if I'm not mistaken, when did Isle of Dr. Moreau come out? The one with Michael York. Was I that before? I would have put that in mid-70s. I'm not 100 Because the sure. makeup was like straight out of that. Wow, it's been so long since I've seen that film. I, I actually thought their makeup was better, but I'll, I'll take your word for it. Maybe well, the makeup was a little bit better in this episode, but the basic facial structure was really, really similar. Um, not to mention, uh, it's the, the way it's applied is not too dissimilar to the, uh, simian makeup that was used in the planet of the apes. All you got to do is change the face a little bit, but the application, the way, and the moles were not that dissimilar. And there was a little bit of the face from the uh, gremlin from twilight zone there too, with the little piggy nose and the kind of, it was, yeah, it was a, it was an interesting little. But it's Preacher. it's 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 a lot of recirculation that's going on. I mean, that's that's a lot of what we've been getting here, 
And it's it's network television again. We, we, we they call it upcycling nowadays. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, it's uh, taking old stuff and making it newer and better. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. Uh, sure. The, by the way, the plan for the space shuttle uh, was originally uh, made in 1969, although the test flights didn't occur till the, it uh, looks like the 80s, early 80s. Well, the first actual first shuttle flight, flight was, was April 12th, 1981. Right. But there had been, I believe, two launches of the Enterprise off the back of a Boeing, just to see it, just to have it glide uh for for test purposes only and that was in the 70s late 70s if i remember right like 79 or something like that yeah could be it's not immediately showing up here in wikipedia but uh uh anyway yeah it's still it's just like okay there you go but yeah it's as he said it's it's a lot of the recirculating of whatever nbc could get their hands on and it's it keeps coming back to what i've said all along and that is they really didn't care about their product. And in some ways, maybe they didn't have to. I mean, they, they probably knew that there was an audience out there starving for science fiction. And they, they thought, you know, I, we can put together crap and they will watch it. We know that they were sitting there in their studio sauna bath with their secretary doing whatever the secretary was doing. And, and they were sitting there going... When we're t- we're making a show that they're going to be talking about in the year 2015, I promise you that. Well, well yeah, they were right. Enough, they're right. We, we are talking about it, but again, perhaps it's, not it, fondly, it, but we are no, talking about no, it. but we are talking about it. But it still comes back to because there is nothing else out there, and people are desperate for it. We can give them anything, and it sets the bar very, very low. So. What did we get? We got this. We got other shows like Man from Atlantis. I mean, I mean, we're talking really poor quality for American sci-fi. And it's because they could get away with it. I mean, they knew people were going to watch it. Hell, I was glued to the television every Thursday night. Unfortunately, not because the show, it was, fortunately not, the show was on Wednesday night, but I was glued there Thursday. No, I'm No, kidding. it was Thursday no nights. <laughs> um, and, and it's not because it, I, whether I thought it was good or not. I mean, I watched it because it was there. It's the same thing like when, when Star Lost was on. The only reason I watched it uh, as much as I did is because I had nothing else. Going to ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Which show has more originality in it? This or Star Lost? Oh, dear God. Um, because I kind of feel like... I had to say, I think Star Lost does. I think we got more out of Star Lost than yeah, we did Star out of Star Lost this. has got more originality. It was... It's terrible. <laughs> And, and it was to horrible execution, <laughs> yeah, horrible execution. But it had it, it had more original thought. The, I had this I had this uh, discussion uh, not too long ago with, with Simon, and I understand his point when we were talking about the U.S. pilot for Ultraviolet that was a that was a disastrous train wreck. But it was, and I was trying to convey the notion that it was competently put together. That is, that a group of professionals did assemble the pieces it's just that it's done in such a you know it's like a ford pinto it's competently put together by machine <laughs> but just don't bump but, it in the but back it's a terrible terrible it's thing still a bad car yeah and yeah. Uh, unlike the star lost which was incompetently put together i mean i think True. that shows at many levels that the that the production team just really wasn't there was a production Good. team? Yeah. They, they didn't know what they were doing. So no. it wasn't, you know, it was like you're hiring. It would be like if they hired me and said, okay, you're going to be, you're going to be the editor. It's like, all right, I do know my way sort of around an editing suite, but at, you should not be putting me in charge of editing a TV show. And that's how I feel that they did um, with the Star Lost. But mm-hmm. uh, this was, so, uh, all right, Willoway. Let's talk Willoway. Willoway uh as we know, started off as that evil, evil, evil man in that first episode that we had him in. And in the last episode, we saw some of that sort of, oh, when will man ever learn about fighting and things? And that's in we evidence got, here. We got a little bit of that again at the beginning of this episode. But we also got this sort of, wow, um, you know, pretty lady like you should always be smiling. I tell you what, I'll save the day for you if if you'll just promise to keep smiling. For me, that was, 
Well, I don't we know. know that he likes pretty ladies. He wanted to keep Liana to himself when we first met him. To, to be fair, yes, but he just so some characteristics remain. He's still a little creepy. I don't it know. is. It is a little creepy. <laughs> But the thing that really bugged me about his entire storyline is that what was the purpose for the deception? Really, uh, it's, it's, it makes for bad writing. Usually when you have a, a major scene development, there is supposed to be some kind of payoff in some, some form or another. And in this particular case, the, scene betwe- the scenes between Willoway and Tarrant ended up becoming nothing more than just a waste, almost as if the writers wanted uh, Willoway out of the out of the way. Pardon a little play on words there. Uh, because they really had nothing else to do with him. His, his entire scene... Okay, we know he's going to be deceiving Tarrant. We get that right up front. So the scene, that, that, that whole dialogue was... It was not for the viewer's benefit. Not in the, not in the slightest. Um, so... If there had been some kind of good ramification that came out of what he did, okay, great. But that didn't happen. Instead, he gets caught. He gets he gets in prison. But it doesn't negatively affect either any of our of our other travelers. They still succeed in what they're doing, despite what Willoway does. So his scenes become nothing more than just an enormous waste of time. And a lot of scene chew- and, and scene chewing. It's interesting that you should mention that because when I watched this episode, I felt that they had just dumped Varian, Fred, Scott, and Liana off in Nowhere's Land so that they could concentrate on Willoway. But they got something. They 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 established something. Even Scott a little bit with his conversation with Luther's son, Nikki. There, uh, bet- with Scott, we get the backstory. But you a know, tiny we, bit you know about who these people them. are. What? We didn't get anything in terms of, and I, I, I loathe to use the phrase character development, but we got nothing of character development in Scott, Fred, Varian, or uh, Liana, but we did from Willoway because we saw Willoway willing to risk his life to help somebody and how deceptive and he thinks of himself as a thief. So we, we get... We actually got something of Willoway out of this episode that, yes, it didn't save the day, although it did precipitate them saving the day by him pushing his plans forward, which caused everything to fall apart. But, but yes, it's an unconventional end to it. But, you know, Varian was just Varian. Fred was just Fred. Scott was just a bump on a log. Liana wiggles her eyes again. And, and Willoway was willing to take risks and alienate his friends and... And try to do something. So interesting, and it's Willoway's story that I hated the most. It's the one that bothered me the most out of this episode because it did nothing. I did not get any sense of development because I already knew. And 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 I granted, I I admit I'm being very unfair because I had this pre you know this knowledge already. But even if I hadn't, it's it's clear that Willoway is the only one who is two faced enough. Or yes. is duplicitous enough? Du- duplicitous. Uh, gosh, I can't even say the word. To to be able to pull that kind of a stunt off, that's already established. So I don't feel like I'm getting anything new out of what he's doing. Do, don't and you then, think it's, sorry, that it's interesting that in many a show they would have had him jump sides and have the audience wondering, well, is he really turned bad? And then and then at the end reveal he was faking it. When in this episode they tell us he's going to go fake it, then he goes fakes it, then he gets rumbled. It, it's an odd structure. Now, and that that's part of my problem. Had and, and I, I I admit the, the the part that bothers me most really is the fact that he, it's announced that he's going to be playing this game. But they had to do that to get that scene with oh, but I want to see your pretty smile. It, it, that's a weird thing. Too. Yeah, I know. It, it's so it, when, what we end up, end up having is some very bad. It, it's almost like the writers kind of put themselves into a corner here. They painted themselves into a really bad corner and were not really able to take Willoway's story into some sort of a satisfying conclusion. All we could get is 
him being tossed in jail and then being a bit snarky when Varian comes down for the rescue. I would have preferred this episode to be immediately following his first episode. It would have worked better. It would have worked better. I, I'm kind of with... In fact, I, I wonder if that maybe that wasn't the case in terms of production value. I, I'm kind of with Fred on this. I mean, Varian is like, oh, yeah, I know Willoway is a good guy. And Fred's like, we should have dumped that guy as soon as we could. Because I'm still not forgiving him for his complete and utter evil mustache twirling turn in the other side of the mountain or whatever the name of that episode yeah. was. That is that is just so hard to reconcile with the sort of in the in the next episode with the children, he's he's got a sort of Doctor Smith vibe to him about not wanting to work, not wanting to do anything. But when he gets the opportunity to wax philosophical, you can see that he is um, a pacifist and a, a a bit of a cynic about the human race, but at the same time a dreamer. Yeah, and he's able to really play. Um a lot of, uh, you know, not, not to borrow something from the the people at uh, uh, Mission Log, but he's able to do a lot of, of verbal jujitsu and really get the people to think about uh, what they were really, you know, get, get the leader of that one particular episode to really think about what he was doing and that how he was just as guilty as the other adults that he was trying to get rid of. So, yeah, there's there's a very weird kind of... Uh, I wouldn't call it inconsistency. I mean, it's it's like these very weird layers in within Willoway. Um, I can understand why Fred would want to jettison him right off the bat because you know all the all that Fred has is the episode that we that he first met him in. Varian has got uh, something else though. He's got this advantage of having a sense of the future or or knowing the future and knowing Willoway's history. So, although why history would ever want to exonerate Willoway um, is a bit of a question because. Every indication was that when he was back, you know, in, in, in his regular time on Earth is that um, he was probably doing some pretty nefarious things back then as well, I'm guessing. Um, yeah. I, it's hard to say. Possibly but working on the A-bomb. He might, have well, might very well have been. He did imply that. Yeah, well, that's true. He, he, could did. Been, he could have been lying, though. That's, yeah, he, and, you know, which, yeah. But he sure, knew, he sure knew a lot about advanced alien technology weapons, too. Yeah. So... Uh, Oh, oh, that was kind of strange. The, well, and then, yeah, his pass off, yeah, the, his, his hand wave is, well, I'm a scientist. Yeah. Well, you know, scientists, we... We, 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 we understand things. these things. <laughs> we know things. We know, we know weapons. That's, that's what yeah, we but, do. Yeah, but again, it's... If... Yes, in order to have... Well, actually, to be honest, if they really wanted to do this right, um, the, and you're right, the scene between Willoway and that, that lady uh, was creepy. <laughs> Whoever that she is, lady. that lady, <laughs> lady, uh, that scene needs to go. Kill it. Get rid of it. It serves no purpose. Have him, have him maybe observe her, and then he quietly, silently reasons out this strategy, and then without telling anyone, mm -hmm. does this new uh, subterfuge. That would have worked, even if he had failed at that point. You know, even, you know, and at that point, the story could continue going on the way it was in terms of him being caught. Of course, granted, then you have no reason for him to be caught because you don't have her blurting out. Right. Um, it takes a thief to catch a thief. Yeah. Right. So, again, you, you get kind of caught. But if you could find some other way for Taryn to realize that he's being had and, and, and then Willoway still fail – it would have worked a lot better because then you're playing the audience, and I would have found that to be more satisfying. And then I would have gotten a be and at that point I would have gotten a better sense of character development out of Varian, because I'm being taken along for the ride. I'm not being taken for any kind of ride here, anyway. and that's why that that's why I didn't that, that's why it didn't sell. I, I got a I got a question for you. So idiomatic phrases in in the English language. I mean, you can have a you can have a phrase that um time and tide melts the snowman i i can't think of one off the top of my head oh now, but, but you're you, wondering about it takes a thief to catch it a takes thief? a thief to catch a thief isn't that one that any person who could speak english would realize i mean that is about as literal as it gets i mean well, I, the, well would, taryn would you, figures it out yeah taryn figures it out but the girl didn't oh I mean, she's she dumb read it. yeah she read it off to to the varian and and fred and they're like he said does this mean anything to you he's like yeah it takes a thief to catch a thief does it not did that not make sense to you? It's not even particularly, you know, 
wide the while while we the butter c- flies or what you know I some know. other well, phrase that no one would get if they hadn't been explained what it was to play devil's advocate and i'm th- and i admit this is an enormous stretch that i'm going here with um she's an innocent and when i mean innocent i mean she's dumb so she's not all that just just not all that bright and and figuring out what willoway is trying to do and what he means by saying that Taren for all his goose stepping uh melodramatic whatever you want to call it uh at least him is he's pretty bright i mean he's 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 bright enough to be able to try and create some sort of um a Fire takeover a weapon in an arsenal yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah that's really brilliant <laughs> But but well okay yeah he's not very bright what can I say? <laughs> he, he's an idiot <laughs> he's really he's really stupid but he's brighter than her no I I, I think we also had ascertained that the little ape creature was brighter than most of them too that's true that's a disturbing piece too this is an intelligent creature an actual intelligent creature that can communicate if only it had a way through telepathy with Liana yeah. and they don't know this. They share a planet with this creature, and they keep them for pets, and they don't know they're actually sentient beings? Well, hey, the dolphins have been trying to tell us for years that the Earth is going to be destroyed, and we're just thinking they're doing tricks. <sighs> I, I, Thank you, I Douglas Adams. I suppose, but it did. it was kind of... Saxon's character was so dismissive of the creature. Uh, it's just a, it's, 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 imagine well, somebody naming it. Well, Saxon's character was dismissive of anybody. Yeah, but I didn't get that feeling that that attitude was was a, an outlier attitude for his people. I think they no. all think they're just dumb animals. Yeah, no, no, you're you're right, you're right. But there's something about Saxon. Saxon is um, he's he's like any other insane, mad dictator. Um, I mean, you could draw. Uh, a bit of a Hitler comparison because he has this one line uh, at one point in the episode where he talks about taking their force, his military and marching into the other time zones and, and doing a purge. That was an odd phrase too. purge. Yeah. Of what? You don't even know what's there. It doesn't matter. Purging anything that is not them. It was kind of like the implication that I was getting. So to him, he's got this, this sense of, if they're not like us, then they're bad. And then, and in the case of this pet, well, it's not even humanoid. It's it it looks like a beast. Therefore, he's he's already dismissive of it, and already assuming this this thing is beneath me. And and it's 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 something that can be. You know, I, I could kill it, and I wouldn't even think twice about it. Hmm. So, how the most disturbing aspect of this program. And I mean, this this really, really shook me to my core because they did something in this episode that that really undermined my entire understanding of 1970s television. And this is during the conversation between Willoway and Tarrant. And Willoway is being pumped for information by Tarrant. And Willoway explains that as they keep going west, that in the next zone... There's a bunch of children, and in the next zone, there's a particularly nice, peaceful place where he lived for a while, and then in the next zone, there's this advanced city of Atlantis. Now, that means that he correctly identified the episodes in order as if there was continuity between them, and that can't possibly be true. And he even told about Atlantis, and he said, well, I actually wasn't there. My friends told me about it, as if the writer hadn't forgotten that, because I could have easily seen them say, and then we were in Atlantis, and you'd be going, "Uh, hey, he wasn't in that episode. But no, they got it right. Yeah. I was, and, and, and we now know they're traveling due east. East. Yeah. I don't know why, but uh, due east it is. Um. Anyway, yeah, that, that, that actually, I was like, that, that really doesn't seem right for 1970s TV. How is that going to work in syndication? How, is, how, how do they know? I, I know f- darn well that TV shows, when they are made, things happen, American TV shows, particularly back then, that they don't get done when they're supposed to. 
They, uh, yeah. Or the networks don't particularly like a particular episode, or they like a particular episode, or they don't want to be up against something, or they do want this episode to be up against something else. And so they play fast and loose with the order. They always have, and that's one of the reasons we didn't get stories with continuity in it. But this Not one was, then. Not then. Not at no. all. No. I can't think of any show that, apart from... Oh, it's roughly Christmas time. Let's throw out the silly Christmas episode. Apart from that, no. Oh, uh, I, I wouldn't even qualify that as continuity. Not really. No. No, no, no continuity no. is... Sort you know, of that, an awareness that, of time. Yeah, exactly. No, continuity is where you can actually connect an episode to another. And, I mean, as we've discussed, I mean, you, uh, Lost in Space did it. There at the beginning. Um, well, they did it even in it, even into its third season. There were one or two episodes where they did callbacks, so it did happen, but it was very rare and it was in passing, so to speak. I mean, you might have a character come back, but they never really drew upon <laughs> if, uh, if and, and but but it was all but what made that kind of safe is that it was they never brought a character back in the same season. They never did a callback to an episode from the same season. It was always something from a previous year. I have to say that if they actually remembered what happened from episode to episode in Lost in Space, Don West would have shot Dr. Smith. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gilligan, too. Um, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but, yeah, Lost in Space was, like, the only show that I know from that time or earlier that had... Any of that. Not even Star Trek did it. Well, I mean... You, to my knowledge. Well, okay. Yeah. Yes. The, okay. Uh, mud. If you bring oh, a that's character... Oh, that's... I'm back, sorry. I, t- you, 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 I stand corrected. Bringing You're right. Back, mud. Bringing back a popular character is the extent, usually, of what you would see. Yeah. And that was the shows. only time that has ever happened to my memory was with Mud. And it's usually... You're right. It's usually um, different seasons. Because it's safe. Back. Well, it's not just safe. It's because they don't know yeah. that the character is going to be popular. It's like we just talked about uh, John Saxon uh, in The Six Million Dollar Man as the day of the robot. The next year, Oscar Goldman gets kidnapped by the same robot maker and turned into a robot. Mm. Right? So it, not, not John Saxon's character, but the villain of the piece, the robot maker. And uh, I think he came back for one more. Uh, later on, yeah, he did, and I can't think of its name off the top of my head. But yeah, and and as you're in, and with six million dollar man, they I mean introduced those um, aliens um, that had Bigfoot, Bigfoot, yep. yeah, and, and the fembots, and, so, and the, yeah, the fembots. So yeah, there were, there were callbacks there as well. So it did happen, but as you're you're right, they they were spread out. It, it's 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 uh, like I said, it's it's kind of safe, but but I think you make a good point in that. You really don't know where your show is going to be going because you're not working with the idea of creating continuity. So in that case, I think any kind of continuity that exists there is purely by happenstance. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Turns out that Jamie Summers character was really popular. I wish we hadn't killed her. Killed her. Oh, dear. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Anyway. That will be for the Six Million Dollar Man when we get to that. Uh, oh, won't in that be the fun? Twenty twenty thirty five. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll be in our seventies. <laughs> so, I wish I hadn't thought of that through for a second, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're right. <laughs> Scary, isn't it? But yes, this show three episodes in a row, and he basically he described them. them backwards. Yeah, in reverse order. Tragic. Yeah, it's shocking. shocking. It's really? shocking. Absolutely shocking, yes. Um I I and that's that is the, the biggest sense of continuity that television had ever done, to my knowledge. Wow. Really This is a groundbreaking show. It was. That's why we're reviewing it on Fusion Patrol, because it's uh it's 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 one of the most groundbreaking shows in American television. Yeah, only topsoil though. <laughs> Uh, I don't know that I have anything else about this episode. As I said, Tarrant wasn't exactly the brightest bulb when he went to uh, start shooting his laser in a uh, in the municipal arsenal dump. Oh. Uh, you have to wonder about the arsenal dump. So, am I right here that the the crux of this story was that one the first counselor, whatever he is, Major Domo or whatever his name was. Major was, Counselor, I think. Uh, Major, he was he was dying. 
Yeah. But he'd convinced all the troops that he was dead already. And he kept convincing them they were dead already by keeping them away from the city where they were staged, ready to go on the march when he became the major council, which seems like if they thought he was dead already, why not just tell him he is major council and go off and do the fights? But, okay, we'll, we'll just take that one as red. But if that's the case... And his troops are all out there, hidden somewhere, ready to go on the march. Why would the weapons be in the city where the troops aren't? Well, they were still assembling. Okay. I didn't say it was smart, but that is what happened. They were still assembling the weapons. All right. I can take that. They did mention something about them being not ready and not put together. That is true. That is true. So, yeah. Well, perhaps, perhaps Tarrant is not the brilliant tactician that he perhaps uh, makes himself out to be. No, he was just uh, some, you know, he, he was a tin-plated dictator with delusions of godhood. Oh, have you got anything else on this? Well, all, all I can say, I mean, to me, this episode really felt horribly cliche in terms of this society that is kind of mirroring some sort of Third Reich, if you will. It, I found it unimaginative. I thought Willoway's story was meaningless and it served no purpose uh, for for any reason whatsoever. Um, to me, I found this episode to be very, very badly written, and um, I seriously dislike it. That's it. Hmm. Well, I can't say I endorse this episode by any stretch of the imagination. No, and and, and one line that that uh, Tarrant has that just made me cringe is when he talks about his birth of a new order. It's like, oh, really? Do you have to go down that road again? Remember in 1977, we were a lot closer to that, uh, the events of, say, World War II. It's true, we were, I agree. But it is interesting watching some of the programs, in, particularly in the 60s, where it's so obviously fresh in, in the... Mo- I mean, for crying out loud, the Daleks in Doctor Who. I know, you know, and it's funny. It, it's funny you mention that because um, I did a review uh, with somebody else, uh, with with uh, Mike Hickerson from Slice of Sci-Fi, and we talked about uh, Dalek invasion of Earth, which was conjuring some very very scary kind of images in in a London that had was not very far removed from World War II at that time. Particularly the Blitz, yeah, yeah. That was a very effective way of being able to make that historical connection in a science fiction sort of way. That was brilliant storytelling, and it, it was just I I I can't fault I can't uh, fault that episode. It, it, it was, is interesting that you could you could make that. Let's pretend it had never gotten made. That the Daleks hadn't been popular as they were, and you made this episode today. The audiences do not have that frame of reference fresh in their minds that's true it would take that it could be the word for word the same story and it would not have it wouldn't the same translate impact no it wouldn't i mean I, I could you know you can imagine oh my city's wrecked and all that stuff but you wouldn't you wouldn't viscerally be able to pull it back and go like i remember when it no, actually you're right. was you're right you're absolutely right i mean i could i could watch the episode and make the connection on a very uh logical sort of way but it is not going to have any kind of visceral effect that the people in England might have been feeling when they saw Dalek Invasion of Earth when it first aired. I'm sure that must have kind of been a bit chilling to them, especially to the older people who are watching Who, you know, and how, how kind of freaked out they were. Now you come forward to 1977 and you give us this thing. And not only is it so far removed that... We cannot quite get that emotional resonance like Doctor Who was able to achieve with with the Daleks, but it is so badly executed that to anybody who is a student of writing or uh, a student of history would look at that and and possibly find it insulting. How do you, know, you know what? The other thing that's kind of funny about that, I mean, I stand by what I said about the the the. Dalek invasion and the, the visceral people who lived through that. But at the same time, maybe I'm just jaded or cynical or something. But there's a there's a phrase that 
has been used in some movie trailers and some some promotional materials. In a world. No. <laughs> you're close. Ripped from today's headlines. Oh, I, I hate, hate that. that. You watch That's a that. trope. It's a trope, and you watch that, and you go, yeah, you see, you couldn't come up with an imaginative villain. You've got uh, Osama bin Laden there. That's uh, we, We'll give him a different name, but that's that's Osama, or that's uh, the president of Iran, or that's uh, Kim Jong-un, or, you know, whatever it happens to be. They can't do anything but to pull up a person that you're supposed to be able to identify, because that's shorthand. Yeah. And so the, it can be it can be good. Citizen Kane, uh, or or it can be. <laughs> not I'm saying shocked Citizen you actually Kane. said that, but oh well. <laughs> Citizen Kane. I mean, I think there might be some um, there might be some tie in there between some other newspaper guy out there in the world. Mm, that they were, maybe there might be. There might be even uh, tomorrow never dies. Um, I think they were going for for Fox News there, perhaps. But you know, you you you, you can sometimes. Do it, but a lot of the times it's just sort of a, a tacky, it lazy. It's just lazy storytelling to get past the point of having well, to create a villain with some depth. Yes, especially if they are going to be using that rip from today's headlines. That tells me they got nothing. Yep. Because the good shows that actually do come up with a piece of fiction that has characters which parallel um, historical or newsworthy. Care, uh, you individuals, don't notice it. they don't have to say that. Yeah, you don't notice it. No, either. You know, I mean, you, you watch it and you get the thing, and then then later, it you, later you, like, you kind of figure it out Ooh. as you process. Yeah, as you process it, then you start to make the connection. But right off the bat, you're going to be just sucked right into the the excellent storytelling and character development. It's later when you start to realize, oh, holy cow, they actually kind of took me on this little journey here and oh this this person actually represents like Mussolini or or Osama bin Laden whatever um yeah that the and again those good shows movies whatever they may be don't have to rely on that cliche of advertising it and so this fine example of television <laughs> has launched us on a uh, an in-depth discussion of uh Characterization of villains uh, ripped straight from the headlines. The headlines, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. oh, yeah, the stun hunt. We forgot to mention the stupid stun hunt, which oh, occurred God. in the middle of the episode for no apparent reason. That was, yeah, there's another scene that was purely a waste, except possibly to show how cruel they were. And also to give Varian that chance to get, yeah, w- was show I that, wrong show that, about you, Willow? Show, well, yeah, but also to show that Varian would have made an, a, an an amazing quarterback with those running skills. Well, for crying out loud, those people were in, aiming to miss, so he was, <laughs> maybe they didn't realize they were supposed to start aiming to hit him. Mm. That yeah, yeah, that was just it was cruel though. I will say that. I mean, yeah. The, and that, the, that was the stupid the whole little creature did not convince me for one second, and yet at the same time with this sort of <laughs> and being shot and jumping up and down, it was just a, a little yeah. tear in my eye. It it, right, it was not, cruel. But... It 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 was that's that was the whole purpose of that was to show that they were cruel. But I kind of got the feeling that you know we already know, and now you're beginning to border into the area of gratuitous, even though there was nothing really graphic about it. Just the the presentation of it was a bit much. Of course, it did it did show us, and I'm you know I'm just gonna <laughs> I'm putting it out there. Oh dear! It did show us that Willoway has got more stomach than Varian or Liana. Oh, he's oh he is one hell of a poker player. Yeah, I mean he just he sat through it, and he, he, I think that you man could can see, call bluffs. You could see there when when Tarrant wasn't looking at him that it was distressing him a little bit, but in just in his eyes. But then that's because Roddy Medell actually can can act. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, that was that was better better acting than you would normally. Cause, yeah, I mean, look at Varian. It's like oh, I gotta go get him. Thing. You just yeah. It yeah. was it was a good scene in terms of Roddy's reactions. I admit, but um, yeah. As, it's aside, yeah. Well, how far I, could he have gone? What if they'd killed the creature? What if they'd incinerated it right there? Could Roddy, have, could, could Willoway have held the pose? I, I, 
I kind of think he could. I think he would have because he's that Things dark. dead anyway. I mean, what could you do? But Yeah, exactly. And he probably would have looked at it that way. It's like, the creature is dead. There's nothing that I can do to bring it back. I still have this job to try and figure out where the military forces I are needs stationed. Because I need me some smile. Because I need, that, I need that lady to smile. She didn't so, even give him a kiss at the end. Did did, no. did, did did you Did that seem also not consistent with American television? She said, you know, oh, I saw you smile, and that's, that's my payment. And she said, oh, you need so much more. And she didn't even give him a kiss. That really didn't seem right. I mean, I personally don't think that that's an appropriate way for two human beings to behave, to just suddenly somebody reach over and kiss you, but then I'm that kind of person that doesn't think when two people who don't know each other very well say goodbye, they shouldn't have to give each other a hug either. It's just, I'm not that person. But You're not for, that kind of person. But in television, usually the farewell scene, you get the kiss, and Will Wade didn't get it. No. And she said, you deserve a whole bunch more. All right, I'll take the kiss. No, nothing. I mean, I'm not even not even going further down that line. I mean, just just literally from television tropes, that just seems like she just like. Did you not read the TV 1970s TV playbook? Apparently, not. I'm trying to. No, I haven't seen that many things that Roddy McDowell was in, but I'm trying to remember. If everything that I've ever seen him in, I don't think I've ever seen Roddy actually kiss a woman. Planet of the Apes. Well, that, kissing that doesn't count because he had he had a makeup a on, ton of, ton of makeup on. Uh, I mean, it's possible. I mean, he could be doing a Patrick Magoo in there. Um, and Roddy was gay. No, please. <laughs> I know. Next, you'll be telling me Liberace was too. Never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we don't own him. Yeah, I know. Uh, but you know, typically actors do kind of have to kiss people they don't necessarily like. That's, that, that is true. That that is true. But there have been some. That found the idea, you know, some there have been closeted gay actors that found the idea of kissing a woman highly unpleasant. So Roddy might have been one of them. I don't know. You know, and again, I could be really wrong on here. I've never seen all of Roddy's work, so I can't tell. I mean, all I really know him is from uh, an episode of Batman where he played uh, Bookworm. Mm -hmm. um, I know him from obviously Planet of the Apes, uh, from. Uh, a Friday couple of night? Disney films. Oh, I take it back. No, he did kiss in a Disney movie. He was yeah, he did kiss. In a Disney movie. Uh, Bull Whip Griffin. He did kiss. He kissed a woman there. So I take that back. He did. I forgot all about that film. Yes, but after that, he never. He had it in his claws. From that was it. On. He's like never again. Um, I. Who knows? I mean, there, there's a lot of strange emotional motivations that the characters are given in this show. Uh, so by the time we got to Roddy leaving you know saying goodbye to to her uh at that point nothing surprises me in terms of what does or does not happen it's it's as if the writers may not have been the greatest observers of the human condition you think uh, yeah right maybe i mean the ep this episode and past ones are kind of replete with that i mean they take ideas and concepts that they think are the human condition and run run for their lives with it, only to come up with something that's really way the heck off. Because they, as you, you pointed out... kids? Uh, no comment. Um, because they really, again, don't understand the human condition. So a lot of human motivation that would be considered honest and truthful, thrown out the window. All of it. Actually, yeah, pretty much. Actually, everything we've seen so far, I, I, I said it half in jest, but but the kids, I mean, that's such a ridiculous premise that nobody would have come to that to come to that societal situation. And going back an episode, as I said, the care, the fact that Ronnie McDowell was able to take over these aliens and set up his own villa and have basically his own uh, army for capturing women that he's going to force to marry him and then even going back to Atlantium everybody's motivations just seem like really you couldn't come up with a better system than this it, mm. it all it all just seems like you just you just missed it you just missed it by a mile mm, yeah pretty much and so having now established that the writers 
of Fantastic Journey have no clue what human emotions or the human condition is, we look forward to the next episode, an act of love. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sadly, that. I actually do remember that. I, that one I, I do remember. And it, I hated it then, so I can only imagine what my reaction will be when Spoilers. I watch it this time. <laughs> well, despite the quality of the episode, thank you for joining me. Oh, it's fun always. <laughs> and listeners, I hope you'll join us all again next time on Fusion Patrol. End of line. Fusion Patrol is a Lone Locust production. Like us? Leave us a review on iTunes. Or stop by and visit at our website, fusionpatrol.com. Find us on Facebook or Twitter. Search for Fusion Patrol. Or just drop us a note at feedback at fusionpatrol.com. Our music is Fight the Future by Amber Wolf.